Hi, I'm Ben. And I'm Carl. And you're listening to Secret Sonics. Honest conversations chock full of tactical advice to help you build your dream career in music and audio. Whether it's skill development, mixing mindsets, personal branding, or work-life balance, we talk about ways to help set yourself up for success in the ever-changing music industry. Let's get started. Hi, Ben. Hey, Carl. (laughs) (laughs) So uh, you wanted to talk about the role of the mixing engineer in 2024. Well, you wanted to, yeah. to talk about the role of a mixing engineer, and I wanted to add the little in 2024 caveat at the end, because I think that the role has changed over the years, and mm. I would love to hear your thoughts on it and kind of how you see yourself in the role of mixing engineer. Yeah, great question. So traditionally, the mixing engineer is the person that you know takes the raw tracks and makes them sound as good as possible together in one cohesive, wonderful package that hopefully makes the song sound and feel as good as it can. And it's like the second to last stage, I guess, in the the process before mastering. And, you know, I'm sure you're going to talk about this, how all the roles have blurred a bit in the music industry because, you know, the producer will give a rough mix, which is very close to what they want it to be. And the mixing engineer is smashing the mix, not giving much headroom or whatever left for the mastering engineer. And, I'm sure you're going to talk about things that you do that are maybe even more in the production side of things as a mixer. So things are kind of blurred. I was actually listening back to the podcast episode that I released today with uh, Matt Huber, and he was talking about, you know, how he receives files and stuff. And I was thinking the way he does it is so brilliant because he he buys like every plugin. So he will take the producer's session exactly how it is, and they never have to think about more than they're just sending exactly what they did. And that was just making me think about like streamlining and ease of use, I guess, or like being like facilitating the people that you're working with as much as possible. I think as a mixing engineer, I'm here to kind of communicate with the artists and the producers and get their vision across the the finish line as easily as possible. Because I feel like the mixing engineer is a facilitator and it's not really about what I'm doing or trying to bring to the table as much as me helping the artist, the band, or the producer make their dream, you know, make it sound like they really want it, make it feel like they really want it. So I guess that's kind of, in my mind, the role is to kind of be that really smooth transition from a mostly baked product to a basically baked product, sans mastering. <laughs> Does that make sense? I think so, yeah. I'm I'm curious, though, because you... So we're recording this episode on January 1st, and you just released that episode with Matt literally, I yes. think, five minutes before we started recording these episodes. <laughs> yes. So I put an end to the fir- to Mach 1 of Secret Sonics and began Mach 2 of Secret Sonics on the exact same hour. Which, which is great. However, that means that it was physically impossible for me to listen to that episode, even though it's phys- by yes. the time this is out, that'll be out for like a month. I could have sent you the, an edit or something. Yeah, you, yes, c- you could have yes. been. But you didn't. Jackass. <laughs> so uh, so what I'm curious about <laughs> is when Matt gets sent project sessions from different dolls, all the different plugins, I guess what is his process? Does he talk about his process like uh, mentally or like spiritually, I guess you could say, about like kind of getting into the head of the producer or the artist, trying to enter yeah. the session as an insider as opposed to entering it as an outsider? Yeah. Well, he kind of mentioned that it's just faster for him to try to get into their workspace workflow than it is for him to kind of force whatever it is that they had going into his workflow. Because by the time he rebuilds the chain, you know, tries to use his auxes and everything, it's just like it would have been faster for him to kind of just imagine being the producer or the artist or the band that rather than the mixing engineer. And I, you know, I think there's definitely there's he mentioned it's about just doing it a bunch. Right. Yeah. Like, and that's, that's not really an approach I've been able to do yet, but I, I'd like to try, you know? It's interesting. It's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I have a very different approach, (laughs) very different, but I think, but I think for, for a similar. It's not my approach yet. I'm, I'm, I guess my point of that is like, his point was that he tries to make it as easy as possible for people to work with him. And I think my point is that I do think that that is a big thing of what I do is that I try to be easy to work with, with the artists. I'm, you know, I don't have like revision counts. I'm here to kind of be their, their helping hand, their support team, you know, to get it where they want it. 
Yeah. Being it, being that it's their vision and I'm facilitating that, so to speak. Totally. totally. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, the way that I get files from clients for mixing, well, I, I don't own every plugin, for, first, <laughs> first and foremost, because actually I really only ever use like a handful. Like I definitely yeah. have more than I use, but the ones that I use, I use a lot. Yes. But what I have had the most luck doing, and this is because I try to have a very open dialogue with my clients throughout the whole process, I usually ask them to just send me all of their instrumental files with their effects and processing baked in, and then just send me the lead vocals, like a, one version with all their processing and one version with like just tuning and all their EQ compression sends and all that stuff turned off. So I usually start with their printed instrumental effects things. And then I just tell them right from the beginning, like, hey, like I want to start from there because that's where you left off. But if there's anything that I hear and I think, oh, you know, I wish you could turn off the delay on the guitar part because it's not quite edited tightly enough and the delay is tripping over itself and kind of flaming. But I think if you did, if you took that off and we edited it a little bit better, then we could put the delay back on and it would achieve what you're going for without the unintended consequences of the like the flams, you know? Mm-hmm. Like I try to have that producer's ear when I'm work, working on things and I'll be able to tell them, hey, I, I love this. However, the reverb you're using is just way too, whatever, way, way too sizzly. Could you reprint this with the reverb turned off, you know, or adjust the setting, you know? And I, I like to start with what they have but being able to put it into my own workflow because I can be a lot more effective and I can much more easily get to their vision because I know the workflow, because I know how my mix session is routed. And that's really what it is. Like my mix session or my mix template, it's really just for routing. So that way I can very quickly and easily do anything that I need to, which I think for me is what enables me to help them to better get to their vision because I'm not having to relearn their, like their thought process. Yes. Especially with as many clients as I work with, because I do mostly, I'm working with artists that mostly do singles as opposed to albums. So I, I probably worked with, I don't know, last year. Well, it's weird to say last year because today's January 1st. Um, But last year, I probably, (laughs) in the past year, in the past year, probably worked with at least 150 artists Amazing. but if i had to learn all of their workflows. production workflows like i i don't have the mental capacity for that i just don't yeah so i can see how that could work for some people that if their brains work that way and they would look at my process and be like that's crazy why would you do that but i think this is what works for my thought process and my ability to yeah. turn off the in a way i can kind of turn off the thinking and just do the the feeling. Yeah. Thanks for thinking, by the way. Oh, you got the <laughs> podcast name right. Thanks, Ben. <laughs> if exactly. you don't get that well, joke, it... <laughs> listen to episode one. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I absolutely feel you on that. And that's that's how I work. I, I also try to like get things into my workflow so that I could work quickly and do whatever I want to do as quickly as possible. So yeah, having those chains, like not like the plugins, but like, you know, the routing basically of, of where things are. That's how you get th- somewhere fast. I was going to say too, I think another consideration for, you know, any mix engineers listening, trying to figure out what the best way for them would be. The question too becomes how many different people are sending you files and sending you projects? Because if for a while I was working primarily with a couple of producers where I was uh, mixing like all of their clients' projects mm-hmm. and for some of them, they would just send me the logic sessions because that actually made a lot of sense because I'd be doing, you know, 30, 40 songs a year for the same producer. So I knew their workflow. So if you're- Yeah, and if, if you're buying only a few plugins, then that's cool. Yeah, yeah. And if you're a if you're a mix engineer and you work primarily with, you know, a handful of producers and you're on their team for projects, then I think it really makes sense to be able to do that because by that point you already have the vocabulary developed with that producer so you know what they're thinking and you know how to communicate 
without talking. And I, a lot of times you can communicate through your through the DAW settings, as weird as it may sound to say. But I know for me, one of the things that I love doing, like I thrive on working with new people. I love working with artists that can produce themselves to some degree and, you know, get it, you know, maybe to the five yard line and I help them get it over into the end zone. But because of that, the nature of that means I'm just working with a large amount of people in a not not the same quantity as like a mastering engineer, but a lot. And I I, I know yeah. for my myself, I would go I would go crazy and I go broke from buying every plugin that every oh yeah different client oh, yeah, would yeah. use. So so it's yeah, purely he, he, situational. That's the thing. It's it's all it's all contextual and situational. No, I, that totally makes sense. And I'm definitely not going to be able to go out and buy every plugin ever. Yeah, and also like you know, it depends what DAW you're using, right? Like you're using Logic. I think he's using Pro Tools. Mm -hmm. So you know, I'm using Logic also. So if someone's, I do get sent projects in Pro in in Logic a lot, and that's usually more like production style stuff where they want me to kind of take the production over the finish line, and then and then there's really not so much routing or weird things happening anyways and yeah. then you could kind of just bring in your own your own routing and and bring it to where you like it it's all legit as long as you know you're facilitating right yeah the, the song yeah and I, I think that brings up a really good point about how being a mix engineer in 2024 or really being a, a mix engineer as technology progresses as the way that we communicate and we share files progresses mm. there are a lot of considerations that i think would have not even been possible a couple years ago. You know, even the ubiquitousness, ubiquity, whatever the word is there. Ubiquitousness. 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 Ubiquitous, uh, ubiquitousness of Zoom and being able to, you know, share screens and share audio and, you know, even, you know, me helping some of my production clients, them sharing their screen and sharing remote control. And I'm there like showing them and like, helping them to set things up to export files. Like there are so many more ways to make things easier for your clients that I, I think that's a really interesting consideration for anybody that is a mix engineer. It's like, what are the, how many different ways can you make things easier for the clients? How many different ways can you make things better for the clients? And yes. then how can you adjust your rates accordingly. Uh, yeah, all these things are, are totally resonating with me. I think a lot of what you were saying, like about like, you know, just give me the vocal wet and dry, you know, it's just so easy to kind of get files sent back and forth these days that like, as long as you are in a good communication with the artist uh, slash producer slash bands or whatever you're working with, it's just super easy to be like, oh, that was good. But like, can you, can you send it to me again dry now? Cause I, I want to try one, 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 one thing that didn't work for me. And it's so easy. Just like the you know, the wheat transfer, the Dropbox. I, I get a lot of use out of file pass and, you know, timestamp revisions and stuff like that. And so there's just like so many ways just to use technology and file sharing to just kind of like expedite all these things where it's just like, you know, it's not like here's my files and like take take it and do your best with it. That, you know, like when I sent out my my record for mastering back in the day and fun, fun story, I had to go remaster it with the guy. But like, I'm working as like a very open communicator. And so that lends itself into my favor of like, and just like the ease of the technology plus the open communication is just like enables everything to eventually get done pretty easily without, you know, too much heartache. Yeah. Am I making sense? No, totally. And that's one of the reasons why I don't use any like outboard hardware yes. for my mixing process. Like everything's in the box. I, I think I would have a different opinion if I got into mixing 20 years earlier than I did, you know, but I think I got, I made the shift from being a session drummer and touring drummer into doing mixing and production right at the time when plugins started actually being as good, if not better, you know, or at least more reliable yeah. than <laughs> the hardware counterparts. And, and more available. And more available and just... There, there's so the, the pros far outweigh the cons, I think, at this point. And sure. then also knowing how easy it is to recall sessions. Like, I've never had to think about recall 
you know? And that's like, there are some generations of engineers that me just saying that gives them shivers, you know, because it's such a pain. So because of that, it makes doing revisions really easy. It makes it really quick and low stress. And that's something right. that clients really appreciate and value. So if I can set myself up in a way that makes it easy to make those changes, because I know how valuable that is to them, that's like, well, yeah, of course I'm going to do that. Yeah. I think that in the box thing that you mentioned is so important. There's just so little friction now because it's like, oh, revision, no problem. Pull it up, recall. It's all there. You don't have to think about it. Like you said, and then yeah. you're done. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like you don't have to spend, you can offline bounce things and you, you, you don't like, you don't have to spend time doing pretty much anything. So like, rather than, you know, printing something in real time through gear, you can just communicate with your, you know, your clients. Yeah. Now I will say, I want to make a, a little disclaimer here. I don't do any tracking. So I think if I were a tracking engineer and, and doing that, or I was producing and tracking a lot of live instruments, then very different conversation, you know, having preamps and, and, and all of that. Um, I also don't have any clients coming in person. Like I'm fully remote. So I also don't need to have any sort of, you know, wow factor to impress clients when they come in the doors. Cause I don't have, th those are not considerations that I need to make mostly by design, you know, because I don't want to have to deal with people coming into my space. And I like when we talked in the last episode about work-life balance, like me knowing that I have two kids and a wife and a dog, and I like having my deadlines be calendar-based deadlines rather than somebody's coming over from six to midnight on Saturday, whatever that is. So there are a lot of considerations that we can take as mixing engineers that are going to not only help the clients out, but also help us out. Yes. Basically, it's never been an easier time to be an en a mixing engineer in, th in the sense of like technology and in the sense of like ease of use. And it's not the same as a, as a recording engineer. And, you know, I talked about, you know, last week why, you know, producing is such a big emotional labor, whereas mixing really doesn't have to be kind of like you like you were saying. So, yeah. <laughs> Hey everyone, friend of the podcast and Grammy-nominated engineer slash mixer Travis Ferentz hosts Progressions, Success in the Music Industry. It's a podcast exploring creativity, productivity, and growth in music. Travis has set out to document his own journey and bring those valuable lessons to you to apply to your own career. Join in each week for conversations with some of the industry's best and brightest about the mindsets and strategies that they use in their careers every day. Whether you're feeling stuck, digging for inspiration, or just looking for a mix tip, Progressions is probably for you. Go check it out wherever you get your podcasts or click the link in the show notes. What, what, what else do you think uh, is the mixing engineer's job these days, Carl? What, like, what do you think are some of the things that a mixing engineer would say, this is part of my, you know, if they were writing a resume, yeah, you know, what, what are those bullet points of like, you know, job, job occupation, you know, main points for the mixing engineer in 2024? Oh, man, uh, I'm going to get a lot of crap for this, I think. There, oh, man, I, I, there are so many disclaimers and so many caveats. So the way that I look at it, I, I will, I'll, I'll explain how I see my role as a mixing engineer. Okay. My role as a mixing engineer is I am mostly, I'm like a co-producer on a lot of tracks, right? Maybe not in a traditional sense and not always in a credited sense, but it's more a matter of a mentality and it's more the focus on keeping my ears open and always trying to listen to the song and not just listen to the song and how that is going to influence and affect my mixing decisions, but things that I notice as a listener, as a fan of the music. And I will always flag things that I think are getting in the way of the artist's vision. A lot of times artists or producers can get a little overexcited and maybe add more things into a song than the song needs. And that can very often complicate the sonics of it, you know, from a purely technical standpoint, but also it can complicate the message of the song itself and actually make it harder for the artist to be able to communicate the emotion that they're trying to evoke from the listener. So I'm always listening for production ideas, songwriting ideas. I mean, I know it's not under the typical description of what a mixing engineer does, but I'm still always going to be listening for those things and flagging them and having conversations about them 
Because even if it's not in the scope of what I'm going to be doing, if it's something that I think is going to help make the song more effectively communicate their vision, I'm going to say something because I feel like it's going against everything that I believe in if I don't. Now, obviously, right. they get- The buck has landed on you now, so- Yeah, yeah. You know. And I don't have the mentality of what I'm given is what I get, you know, right. and I have to right. just do, make the most out of what I've got. Sometimes that's the case, right? But I'm never going to assume that's the case. I'm always going to talk about it and try to figure out- how much flexibility there there is with the production itself, with the files. And what that ends up looking like in practice a lot of the times is me doing additional production for my mixing clients. And, you know, I generally, you know, charge accordingly, you know, it's part of a conversation that we have before they even sign on. And it's a lot of the reason why a lot of my clients come to me in the first place and stay with me. It's because they know that I have that approach. And yeah. Again, I'm not saying my way is right or wrong. That's just what works for me and the kind of clients that I love to work with. Do you find that this happens more with like indie artists versus, you know, more major artists? Are there like artists that are more like maybe up up and coming that that need a little extra push or it's with everyone across the board? I don't have as many, you know, major label clients, so I don't <laughs> I don't I don't want to speak for people I haven't worked with, but at least what I've seen is because of the fact that the music industry is so competitive and social media is so competitive and there's just there's this need and this constant the constant necessity of gaining and keeping attention a lot of times the artists are overwhelmed by everything going on that they're trying to keep up with like whether it's the actual writing or the production or the release plan or the promotions or the pre-release strategy and and all all of the things right so especially because of the fact that the release cycle is so short now, like it's every like, you know, four to eight weeks, kind of depending on who you're talking to, especially because I do primarily like pop and pop adjacent styles. So there's, there's an expectation of fairly rapid fire releases. So I like to be able to come in and just say, Hey, you have so much stuff on your plate that you need to take care of to make sure that this song goes as far as it can let me be the objective ear that points these things out for you. You know, that's the, yeah. the it's the peace of mind that I'm giving yeah. them. It's a QA thing, similar to like what a mastering engineer says, the song is done now, you know, yeah. quality assurance. Oh, I, you know? oh, I was always doing like, I was doing like a QC, like quality control. I think I, I, I was I, thinking my brain, my brain went into I like think they're I think maybe one is more, maybe QA is more British and QC is more American. And I just like have I I don't I speak to people from both countries and I just don't even know anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Either way, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna defer to you and say I'm just dumb today. You're not dumb. It's just it's just one way to say it. I think yeah. the QC and QA are both both applicable. I believe. <laughs> but yeah, the 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 quality assurance of it, you know, that's something that I think is probably one of the bigger pillars of my sales pitch is that. Yeah. peace of mind and the trust that yes. you know that their music is in good hands and that I am going to flag weird things if I notice it and I'm not going to just take their money you know put on some compression and you know put on ozone 11 and uh have the AI do it call for it me and then call it a day you know like I'm not yeah. going to going to do that and the kind of clients I tend to work best with are the ones that really appreciate that and want that and want that collaborative involvement from me, which I think helps to scratch a bunch of itches for me that I have creatively that, yeah. you know, I'm always, I'm all about the scratching the itches stuff. Yeah. I'm into that. So, and I think especially for you, knowing that you're trying to get further away from full productions and focus more on mixing, you know, having that kind of open ear, open mind to the mixes you're working on enables you to still scratch that itch a little bit and still be able to contribute right production wise, but without having to carry the burden of starting a song from the ground up. Yeah. I love that. It's mostly mixing. <laughs> yeah. Mix, mixing plus. Mixing plus. It's and a little extra. And I and I and also like that that QC slash QA, you know, like I feel like that's just like that that massive discography of songs and music that you've listened to throughout your entire life. 
I think like this is like maybe one of my special skills is just like identifying, you know, genres and identifying like snippets or whatever and just like hearing, you know, even where it's coming from, you know, like what they're going for and like, oh yeah, yeah. like I don't know, like somebody sent me a song last week. I was like, oh, this is like very Cat Stevens. And and he wrote back like, my wife says you you pegged me, you know, it's like just knowing that like repertoire in the back of your head, then you kind of have an idea of really what they want to sound like and what they're going for and where the song, you know, might be off and where you can maybe give them some pointers. I, I would say that like, I am probably doing a little bit less production in the mixes that I'm I'm doing, unless I'm producing it myself, in which case I'm doing all the production usually, but I'm often doing a lot of like fine tuning. So like tuning, they didn't quite get right, aligning harmonies. Last week I was working on something where I was just like, this really needs like drums or something to get some movement. And then I offered it <laughs> and the producer, who's a friend of mine said, uh, no, it, like it's still, it, they're not going that that direction. I was like, okay, but I had to try because it needed the movement and you know, whatever. It's like the kind of thing, it's like, it's only going to go where it's going to go. And like, we did the best we could, you know, <laughs> you know, but so it happens sometimes, but usually it's more like doing those extra fixes because my ear is a bit more in tune to that stuff. And also because- you know, as you mix, you start to hear the problems a bit more because things are more clear, there's more clarity, there's less masking and, and stuff like that. So I tend to do a lot of that. And sometimes I do the production stuff, not as much as you, but I think it's always always important to kind of like touch base with the artist or the producer to make sure that it's okay that you're doing that and not just like sneaking it in there. I've snuck stuff in a couple of times and it worked out okay, but I feel like maybe you even warned me not to do it without uh, without telling them. Yeah, <laughs> or at least like, you can always sneak it in and just, it depends. I mean, it depends on your relationship with them, right? Like right. I, I yeah. remember there was an artist I was working with and I snuck something in. I still told them like, you know, we were in the middle of revisions and I just said, hey, I tried this thing, but I wanted to see if you'd notice it first. And and what I did was there was a moment in the second verse, I think, the second verse of the bridge where it kind of gets more sparse. And they mentioned, I forget the exact words, but they mentioned something about like, missing your texts or something. And I found the cell phone, like vibration sound, like sound effect, mm -hmm. like the little like, sound. And I <laughs> snuck it in and I put it in like hard panned it to the right, like really quietly, just to see if it would like make them instinctively like check their pocket, which was the goal. That's amazing. And it worked. And they didn't know what it was. They just thought it was their phone. So when I told them what it was, they were like so excited and wanted to keep it in. So there are ways you can like, be a weird, crazy person and sneak stuff in. But generally, I always try to have a conversation with the artists beforehand or the producers, whoever, and just say, hey, if I have ideas, can I just try them? Knowing that you can always veto any ideas that I have, but I just want to, you know, go with my gut and, you know, take it where my, where I think the song and your vision wants it to go. And then if you don't like it, we can always undo it. And the kind of clients that, are usually attracted to working with me say, hell yeah, that's awesome. Please, 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 please do that. You know, very rarely yeah. do I get any kind of like pushback about trying things. I get pushback about the actual ideas once I've tried them and that's totally fine. I just yeah. don't want to work with artists that don't want to. They want to let you. Yeah. They don't want to let me like. Give it a shot. Give it a give shot. Give it a shot. Exactly. Yeah. I feel like a lot of it is like reading the room and knowing when and how to say those things, yeah. you know? I would say it's a combination of reading the room and asking the room. Based on what you can kind of tell how they, how they might react to it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Given the back, the back and forth. Uh, something I want to talk about in terms of like, I think on the uh, things that have changed for me, I guess we haven't filled out the entire CV, but something that has changed for me, I think, is mixing into limiters and getting things sounding pretty loud. And like, I'm at a point now where I'll send my mastering engineer something that's already limited rather than taking off the limiter because I find I'm just taking off a lot of the glue and a lot of the balance that I, I get towards once mixing in the limiter and people just are used to hearing things loud and that's kind of meshed the mixing engineer with the mastering engineer. So with you, we were talking about the, adding the production elements is sort of almost like before the mix. This is kind of like what maybe was after the mix, but is now also part of the mix is that kind of like loudness and glue and, and limiting. What do you what do you think about that? Is that something that you're you're into, not into? I usually Where are you at with that stuff? my process generally is I will do the mix without 
any limiting on it to try to get it as loud and full as I can. Because typically the kind of music that I'm working on, generally speaking, it's like exciting, like big, full, you know, electronic pop dance Mm -hmm. that kind of stuff Um, a lot of like alternative like indie pop stuff so for me i'm trying to get it to be as powerful without any limiting as i as i can so i'm using limiters actually that no i'd say without any like master chain stereo bus stereo bus limiting like i use all i use a lot of limiters like in the mixing process Mm. like i always have a limiter on my kick bus always on my snare bus always on my lead my overall vocals bus uh, on guitars a lot of times on toms a lot of times you know like i'll i'll probably have like yeah toms i feel like toms are like underratedly like the thing that's hardest to get loud in the mix right yeah oh yeah i I limit the crap out of them um so yeah it's (laughs) so so i use i use limiters a lot but i use them kind of throughout the the arrangement you know, of the mix mm. and You're doing it earlier in the chain, so to speak. Yeah. So that way it's more predictable and controlled because on, the only thing that's triggering the limiter is the thing that I want to trigger the limiter. So by the time that it gets to the, you know, like the mix bus, like I'm, it's usually pretty, like pretty hefty, pretty hefty, but hefty, but sounding good. So what I'll do then is I will usually like, I'll check it in a, with with mastering while I work with sorry I keep on like I'm I'm unintentionally equating mastering and limiting and I shouldn't do that it's just like a <laughs> force of habit from explaining it even though it's not how I actually think about it so without any limiting at the end of the chain I'll uh add limiting into it just to push it and see how f- out of curiosity how far can I push it before things start to fall apart and then that will also enable me to do big like macro changes to the mix. So if I'm working on a song and it's inevitably going to be like slammed pretty hard, like a pretty heavy like rock song, then the sub, you know, like sub drops or even like crash cymbals may end up sounding significantly louder uh, relative to the rest of the mix than they did when the limiter was off. So I'll put, I'll put the limiter back on and I'll go back and maybe like compensate for things and say okay now now the symbols are way too loud every like 85 percent of this sounds really really good what 15 percent can i tweak now that mm. i'm hearing it more like the context that i uh, think it's going to be in but usually like when i send it out to mastering like i probably master now probably or like 60 or 70 percent of my own mixes and when i outsource it i'll send it to friend of the show nicholas de lorenzo at panorama mastering hey, shout out i'll send it to to nick but when i send it to nick it's a very similar process to what i do when i ask my mixing clients to send me files so like i was saying how i'll ask them to send me like the the lead vocal processed and also a lead vocal that's just tuning so that way i can you know try to match or beat their settings because usually the DSer is where it, it, it's, 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 it's something is always awry um, in the yeah. production files. Yeah, but I'll send I'll, <laughs> I'll send him a version with and without the limiter on it, so that way he can hear you know what the clients have been hearing and what I've been hearing and how I envision it, but allowing him to have the file without it as well, so he can try to match it or beat it. Right, I feel like that the heated ref you know, is, is even if you don't send it with the limiter on, I think it's important that the, the mastering engineer understands what the clients have been hearing and also yeah. what the mixer is expecting it to sound like limited, Yeah, you know, to some degree, you know, but I'm, I'm just finding that now that I'm, mi- I'm mixing into the, into a limiter, usually, usually the pro L2. When I, when I remove that, I remove some of the glue, I remove some of the, and, and the balance kind of changes and not not even hitting it hard like maybe you know 2 db or something it just once you remove it like the vocal is less present you know the vocal is further further back in the mix and and it's just the drums are like less exact you know the drum bass even correlation will just sound a little bit different and then once the mastering engineer runs it through the chain it might not be the exact the, the the low end that that you had and and loved so much so i'm committing to the to the limiter at this stage in my in my in my career I probably should do more experimentation with earlier down the chain, kind of like you were mentioning. You know, I will occasionally limit like toms or a kick or or the whole drum kit, depending on what else is happening. But it's not like a that's not a usual. That's like a sometimes. 
sort of thing for me. Totally, totally. I think one one thing that I've found about myself, and this is just from doing like the quantity of of mixes that I do, I've found that I think there there are two things that have really helped to point out. No, there are three things. There are three things that helped to point out my bad habits or my uh, unwanted consistencies. Maybe we'll put it that way. <laughs> First has been Nicholas. You know, you know him. Uh, always giving me feedback on my my mixes, like my pre masters, has always been super helpful, and it, it has made me conscious of things that I did pretty regularly that I shouldn't do, and things that he like. If he gave me notes, like he would give me notes about my kick drum for a while, like almost every mix, there was like a very similar kind of note. And rather than me being like, that's how I want it. Rah, 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 I took that into account while I was mixing. And I made those changes before I, you know, as I was building the track and everything felt so much better. And I'm like, oh, I'm learning from this. Yeah. The second thing that I did that helped me to learn uh, and kind of diagnose some of those mistakes was doing the the, the limiting process that like I was talking about, like kind of trying to get it as as loud and full as I can without the limiter and then turning it on and then adjusting from there. Because it helped me to get a much better sense of being able to set my drums and my vocals and my bass, whatever it is, at a level that I could feel pretty confident that once I turned the limiter on, everything was going to be where I wanted it to be. I could kind of predict how it was going to react. So I didn't have to go back and fix things. I could just know how it was going to translate. And then the third thing, I know I was kind of like making fun of uh, Ozone 11 earlier, but I use it all the time. <laughs> I love it because that has shown me a lot of my bad habits as well, I think. Or not necessarily bad habits, but things that uh, consistently I, I was doing that maybe I didn't like. And I'll use the mastering assistant on the on Ozone 11, because it's actually the first time, in my opinion, that an AI mastering assistant is actually like good, helpful, um, helpful. <laughs> um, I, I don't, yeah, I, I don't think I've ever taken its advice at face value. I usually make a lot of changes to it, but the thing that I've noticed is that when it was giving me consistently very similar suggestions from like across different mixes. And I started taking taking the hint, right? And and adjusting things, my mixes started getting better. So it wasn't that I was mm. following Can you give me an example? Like maybe like Yeah. So like one thing that you notice, like you're too you know, low mid heavy or something. Like I don't, I don't um, know. Um so there's the thing that I really love using is the impact module in there. And it's like a, a transient designer, but it's like a multi-band transient designer. And what I was finding was that I really love punchy mixes and like really aggressive lots of transients and things. And it was always having me like pull them back. Like it was just saying like, oh no, like transients are too transienty. That's a, a word, sure. <laughs> and what it made me realize was that I wasn't taking as much consideration into what should be transienty and what shouldn't be, right? Like we, like it was just like that next level for me of, you know, I'm already thinking about, well, what should be loud and what should be quiet, right? What should be wide versus what should be narrow? What should be bright versus what should be tamed? What should be deep versus what should be tamed? And I never really thought as much about the transients besides like obvious things. And what I started doing was applying the impact module on like my percussion bus, for example, or on my guitars bus um, or my like synths bus to just like tame some of the attack but keeping the attack the the transients um, like on my kicks on my snares on my lead vocals on the things that i really wanted to and all of a sudden it helped to make those elements stick out even more like in, in a good way it helped them to stay kind of in front mm. because there was this like we, we all talk about like frequency masking but i was transient masking mm. and i so it made me just think about a different dimension of mixing that I knew existed. I just never really thought as intently. Um, That's so interesting. I'd love to hear like, you know, he could send me like a, a before and after example. Yeah. Yeah. You know. 
Um, but it's, I'd love to hear that. That's super interesting. But it just suddenly made things feel more like like the stuff that I I hear, you know, on big Spotify yeah. playlists that I love. And I'm like, why? What's different? Like, I feel like the mixes are so my mixes are really good, but I feel like there's something just not quite there yet. And that was a, a little key that unlocked a new way of wow of a uh, of listening to my own mixes. Yeah, so that, that was a bit of a a ramble, but. It, it was very, very helpful with me, you know, like, I, again, like not using it for just, you know, press a button, hit send, tell the client it's done, charge them, you know, a bunch of money for the master. It's like, okay, well, using this to help me to point out things that may be, uh, may not be kind of like what is commercially expected. So then I can then decide, oh, I intentionally want this or, oh, no, this is something that I just didn't catch. Because I've heard the song too many times. So, so before you went into the into this whole tangent, like I was thinking, like oh, like I love how like you know your communication with the mastering engineer is helping you becoming a better master and better mixer, and uh, you know communication with the the producer is helping you, you know, become a better mixer also. And it's kind of like you know we need each other, and it's like you know a, a symbiotic relationship of the mixer and the and the recording engineer, the producer, and the mastering engineer, like. We all make each other better, but maybe just AI is going to take over and do it all for it. And we we could be our, in, in islands again. <laughs> I mean, if we if we want to use this as a way to transition into the next episode and foreshadow, I use AI every day for so many aspects of my business. So that's something wow. I love. I love talking about and would happily talk we'll, about. We'll have to get into AI. I, I'm I'm definitely more averse to it than you are. I'm like I'm afraid of it also because. I think there's 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 a lot there's a lot that we need to think about in terms of like regulation or whatever uh, that people are not really thinking about. You know, the idea of general AI, right, or AGI they call mm-hmm. it. But it's, that's for not this podcast. That's for like the actual smart people podcasts. But yes, I'm definitely a little averse to it, and and I and I I hope it doesn't take away from the kind of you know symbiotic relationship that I mentioned, like how you know raising tide you know, raises all the ships, right? Like how we make the producers better, the producers make us better. We make the mastering engineers better, the mastering engineers make us better. But uh, maybe there's some, the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. Uh, yeah, I mean, I and, would uh, I would, I would, would say- As it usually is. I, I would say this though, that the, the reason that I'm optimistic about how AI can be used, I mean, obviously like I'm not sitting here saying, oh, there's nothing to worry about. There are no issues at all. But I think that, the way that artificial intelligence can be used in music can really be helpful to, you know, to handle a lot of the tasks that maybe are not fun to do anyway. And, you know, getting, doing a lot of like the, the more, not necessarily boring, but mathematically difficult things that will help to get to the vision faster and will enable you to spend more time doing the creative things and doing less right. time trying to, you know, adjust EQ nodes. Yeah. You know, so I, I think there's a lot of, oh, there's so much I could talk about, but I, I think there's another, ep- another, we, episode. we have to s- save yeah. it for another episode. I, yeah. uh, I, I just want to talk about it so bad. Uh. <laughs> we'll, we'll get there. We're going to get there. We're, we'll do an okay. AI episode. Okay. I okay. promise. <laughs> okay. Some, someday. <laughs> But yeah, hopefully, hopefully the AI will remove some of the friction and and it could be a help. You know, sounds like it could be a learning curve. And it, also, Logic now has this built-in like mastering assistant that I messed around with, and like it was it was okay, but it, like it kind of gave me an idea also of like you know even spectral balance. Like oh, like there's a bit of a buildup here, you know. And I, I was just putzing around with it really. Um, but yeah, I definitely understand why you could learn from something. Uh, you know, even even pretending to do a master, even if you're not going to keep it and you don't love it, having an extra ear, whether it's a human or an AI mm-hmm. robot, um, you know, can definitely give you some perspective and and get you out of, you know, we get we go so deep into whatever rabbit hole we're in that sometimes maybe it's just that perspective that kind of pulls us out and kind of sees the bigger picture, you know? Yeah, it's we just can, it's raising questions. A, it's, it's it's raising questions for us that. Are questions that yeah. we should ask ourselves, but sometimes by the point in by that point in the process, 
we've lost the objectivity to be able to even think right. to ask it. I think I think what's hard about mixing is that you can lose the forest for the trees. I feel like in mastering, you're basically only seeing the forest or you're trying to just make the forest look really amazing. As a mixing engineer, you're trying to get it to be that forest, but you're also focused on all those little trees. Um, and uh, the the I think a lot of the challenge of mixing is being able to to zoom out sometimes, you know? Yeah. And it sounds like you're using AI to do that. And um, having a mastering engineer can also be that. Maybe your friends could be that too. So I don't know. Well, I would say I have one a quick little tip, quick little mixing tip for anybody that feels like they have maybe lost that objectivity and can't see the forest for the trees. Something as simple as whether it's in a piece of software or like whether your DAW does it specifically or not, or your hardware enables you to do this. One thing that I like to do is to, in Logic, I can use the utility gain plugin. That's just like the basic function. And I do, all the time. and do the swap left and right at the very end mm-hmm. of your master chain. It's as simple as it is, even though nothing is actually changing in your master or, or your, your mix bus, except for what was in the right is now in the left. And what was in the left is now in the right. Hearing it flipped like that, like we perceive it totally differently than you know, when we've heard that cowbell in the left side a hundred times, we don't realize how obnoxiously loud it is because we're just used to it. So it's the closest thing to being able to kind of reset that demoitis that we give ourselves with the mix. It's just swapping the left and right. And you're gonna every instrument you're gonna hear from the opposite side now, and you're gonna perceive it as a very different mix. And mm. if things still pass the test, great. But you might notice things that you've just not necessarily ignored, but you've heard it so many times before you noticed it explicitly that you just assumed that was, that's just how it is. Yeah. It's like a slick, it's like a slicker mono test, you know? Yeah. Or something. It's like, yeah, it's neat. I never, I never even thought to do that. And, I, but the, I mean, I have flipped right and left in, in things, you know, and also like sometimes just mess with phase alignment and stuff with the, the game plugin. Yeah. And you do realize that there's a big difference between hearing it one way or the other way, you know? Yeah. It's, uh, it's weird. It shouldn't be that big, but it is. The weirder that it feels and sounds when you swap the left and right, the the more you needed to swap the left and right. Because the weirder it sounds, mm-hmm. that means the the more used to that one way you've become and the more familiar you've become. I mean, you just got to like nice. shake shake it up. Amazing. Objectivity machine, Carl Bonner, right here in the house. Hey, yo. So I guess uh, if we can like put a ribbon on this episode, what's the actual role of the mixing engineer? It's being objective- It's being a communicator. It's interfacing between the different layers of the project. And uh, in 2024, specifically, (laughs) you know, doing more, doing those production stuff that you you mentioned. Yeah. Figuring out the loudness thing. Building trust, giving peace of mind, making sure that nothing is sonically getting in the way of the vision of the artist and raising your hand to let them know if you find something that does get in the way. And I I guess I would just repeat being that facilitator. And sometimes that means being transparent. And sometimes like you were talking about, it means getting in the weeds a little bit, but helping get their vision across and not necessarily your vision. (laughs) Yeah. All right, cool. With that said, the role of the mixing engineer 2024, let's hope we do some nice mixing this year and and help uh, help our clients and help the artists we work with. Yeah, and if uh if you agree with us or disagree with us, let us know. Let us know in general what you think about the new format if you're into it and uh things you might want to hear from us, topics, conversation pieces, stuff like that. We're yeah. here and we we're open ears and we take we take feedback nicely. We we don't uh we're not afraid to hear it. So engineers with open ears. I like that. That's yeah. good. Little tagline. Yeah. <laughs> engineers with open ears. Secret Sonics. Bye, Ben. Bye, Carl. We hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as we did. If anything here resonated with you, please share this or your favorite episode with a friend. And as always, we love to hear from our listeners. So find us on social media at Secret Sonics, at Ben Wallach Music, and at Carl Bonner. Until next time. Bye, Ben. Bye, Carl. <laughs> that was good. I think yeah. the outro was great. <laughs>